since I'm a grandpa, see, we get to talk about stuff, and I got a platform, y'all don't. So uh, we, uh, we got to noticing Rhett this week, maybe last week. He'll sit down and sing. And, of course, you know, I don't know what he's sing singing, but uh, he'll, he'll close his eyes and just put his head back and just sing away, play it strumming on a guitar. And I said, I don't know where he saw anybody doing that. And Denise said, it's Colton. <laughs> she said, Colton raises his head a lot and sings. We got to watch it. He does. <laughs> so don't think little kids aren't paying attention to what's going on uh, because he, uh, and he sings loud and long. And uh, when we figure out what he's singing, uh, we'll pass that on. But... Uh, the kids pay attention, and they listen, and they hear more than we think. That's why I think it's important for us to have our, our children not only in Sunday school or Bible study, whatever you call it. We called it Sunday school when I was growing up, but have them in church because they may be coloring and playing and doing all kinds of things, but they hear and pick up on more than you may think. So I want to encourage you to have them. And I'll tell you what. I've said this a lot of times, uh, they'll never bother me, okay? If uh, you have a child in front of you, you're hiding you and they're bothering you, move. You know, just get up and move. Don't, uh, don't be letting it bother you. Just say, I'm going to move to the other side. And then I, I don't think anybody will be upset or mad just, uh, uh, or just suck it up, buttercup. Either way you want to go. Uh, but uh, bring your children. They're not going to bother. Now, if they're run up here and, cut circles around that might be a little distracting but uh just doing the best you can uh and as i say we have a great bathroom with a great spanking place in there and the bible says you're welcome to spank them uh spank them bring them back and after a few times you won't have to do that anymore so you say i gotta go to meddling well i'm not meddling i'm just saying what god's word says if you got a problem with that then you need to take it up between you and God. That has nothing to do with the message this morning, uh, but it may could because we're going to talk about the truth about sin. The truth is the reason it's important for our children to hear God's word is they're sinners from birth. Uh, we were sinners from birth, and we're still sinners today, uh, and that's the truth about sin. We have all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's word, God's mark. We've all failed God. And because of that, from our time of birth, now there is an age of accountability where we're held accountable for our sins, but after that point, uh, we are held accountable for our sins. When we know the truth about sin, uh, we begin to understand that's what God's Word uh, tells us about the, the death, the burial, the resurrection, even the birth of Jesus Christ. All has to do with... Uh, the truth about sin and the truth about eternal life. So John is writing here in, in uh, 1 John chapter 1, and starting in verse 5. We started this last week. I want to finish it up this morning. Uh, this is the word that John gives through the direction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, 1 John 1, 5. This is the message that we've heard from him. He's talking about from Christ or from God the Father. Uh, and we're going to declare it to you. So John is, basically John's preaching. That's what First John is. It's a letter, but he's, he's bringing this to a church. And he says, here's the message. God is light, and in God there's no darkness. And if we claim to have fellowship with God, yet we walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not live by faith or by the truth. But, verse 7 says, if we walk in the light as he, God, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. <clears throat> verse 8 says, if we claim to be without sin, then we deceive ourselves, and the truth is just not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And if we claim we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Chapter 2, verse 1, my 
Dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to our Father in our defense. Your translation may say an advocate. We have an advocate. We have one that speaks on our defense to the Father, and his name is Jesus Christ, and he's the righteous one. And that righteousness, always remember, of just a right relationship with God the Father. Through Jesus, we uh, have a righteous relationship with God the Father. We have a right relationship and justification uh, through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and he is the, verse 2, chapter 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, I just want to real quickly go over last week. Uh, a couple of things we talked about. What John is doing here is he takes three false statements about sin. And, and each of those statements, he begins them with, if we say, that's verse 6, verse 8, and verse 10, and then they're followed up by John's claim, okay? So he's, he's teaching, he says, here's a false statement, that's the claim. Then he says, here's the consequences of that false claim, and then he shows the contrast of God's word. So, so as John is teaching, he says, if we say you claim this, uh, if you claim this, here are the consequences of that action, and here is the contrast between the consequences and what Christ would have for us. So that's how John is teaching this. And, and the first claim he has here is uh, it, it doesn't matter if I sin or not in this life. In other words, he says... Uh, I, you can be a Christian in verse 6 and 7 and still live in habitual sin. Now, I said last week, we read the first part of this, and it says that if we sin, uh, we are filled with darkness and Christ is not in us. And, and it, would, it would be tempted for us to read that and say, hey, uh, well, I'm, I, I still sin. And so, therefore, what John says is, is I don't have Christ because I'm a sinner. Uh, we talked quite a bit about this last week, and, and I, I just want to hit the one high point of that. What John is talking about here is he's talking about walking daily in darkness. In, in other words, habitual sin. And uh, He's talking about that person that, that doesn't just sin, just happens to sin. You know, we all sin every day, and I guess we could sit here and go around the room, and we could think a minute, and we could say, here's where I've sinned, or what have we done that we would say is sinful this week? But he's talking about the person who is persistent and willful and, and tenacious in their habits. In other words, they are walking daily in sin. They don't, they don't really care. They're just persistent. They're willful. They're saying, We're gonna, uh, I, I want to walk in sin. That's, that's who John's addressing here. He's not talking to those of us who sin because when we get down into the latter part of this, uh, of this verse, we're going to see that uh, if we say we don't sin, the truth's not in us, but if we do sin, there's a way out. So, so the first group John's talking to him is that, that those that say, well, it really doesn't matter if I sin. And I think I, I told y'all last week, you know, Paul talked about, you know, when I'm, when I'm a Christian, I do things I don't want to do, and I don't do things I do want to do, and I'm a sinful man, and, and I have this sinful nature. Well, we know Paul was a Christian, but he, he, he struggled with sin, and in, and in uh, Paul's definition of that, he says, but I have Christ who is an advocate for me when I do sin. So, so don't get in our mind that if we are sinning, that, that we don't have the truth or we don't have the light of God within us. We're ta John is talking about those who are persistent, willfully, tenaciously walking daily in sin. They take no regard to what the Bible has to say about sin. He says the consequences of that is we lie and we don't practice the truth. So he's talking to that group that says, you know, it really doesn't matter if I sin. It's, it's not going to be any, it's not going to weigh one way or the other. It just doesn't matter. John says we lie and the truth is not in us. So when a person testifies that they're saved, but they walk in the ways of the world, they live in the ways of the world, they say, hey, it really doesn't matter if I sin or not. I'm a Christian, so it just doesn't matter. I'm going to go on and live the kind of life uh, that the, the world would have me live. Uh, he says that we lie and the truth is not in us when we come to that point. That's the consequences. 
And here's the contrast of that, the other side of the coin, so to speak, is, but if we walk in the light as Jesus Christ is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. So that's the good news there. So John's teaching there. He says if you're walking daily in darkness, if you're walking in sin and you say it really doesn't matter, then we don't practice the truth. We're living a lie. But if we walk in Christ, he is the light, and the light is in us, and we're filled with Christ. So those who walk in the light do so as a reflection of God's power. We're not the light, okay? We are just a reflection of God's light. I talk a lot about shining a, shining a light into a dark world. We're, we, we don't have the light. We don't have the ability to shine a light. We reflect, we reflect God's glory into the darkness of the world. And so, so that's what John's talking about. Here's the second false statement he makes. He says, if I say I no longer sin, and that's verse 8, if we say we have no sin, so I talked about this quite a bit last week, too. We have people that say, you know, I finally reached that point that I, I just don't sin anymore. Uh, that was that Gnostic belief that we talked about two weeks ago, that, that thing that I've reached this higher level than everybody else, and I've moved past sin. Well, John's real clear on that. He says if we say we have no sin, the consequences is that we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So those that had that holier-than-thou attitude, and of course, if you think back to the Pharisees, uh, they, they lived a, a good life. They did live a good life. They knew, they knew the law. They knew the old covenant forward and backwards, and they had, they had rigged it up to make it work for themselves where they could keep it. They had done all of these things, and they felt like they had reached the point of, of, of sinlessness in their lives. They didn't feel like they sinned any longer. They didn't feel like they sinned anymore. And, and we could run off on this and say, you know, that's why they never believed in Jesus Christ. They, did, they believed they had a Christ. And, and so he says of that group, we deceive ourselves uh, and the truth does not dwell in us. Now, I want to remind you of this. This relationship with Jesus Christ, it's not a set of rules and rituals. I said this last week. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I think sometimes as churches and as people that go to church and people that don't go to church, they look at us and they look at Christians and say, well, they have this list of do's and don'ts that we're, we're supposed to follow. And, and we don't have a list of do's and don'ts. I don't have a list of do's and don'ts. Now, I've preached before. We like lists, don't we? Most of us like a list. We like something that we can check off and we can have our do's and don'ts and we can get through for the day and say, well, I've had a pretty good day today. Uh, I haven't sinned. I haven't done this. I haven't done that. I, I, I checked all of these good things off our list. That's not what a Christian relationship, that's not what being a Christian is. Being a Christian is having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what John is talking about. So he says we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us when we claim that we have reached a point of our life that we no longer sin. Now, where I want to kind of start today, and we touched on this last week, is the contrast of those things. In verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, or he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Now, again, we look at that and we can say, well, that kind of contradicts what John started with. It doesn't at all. I think that's why it's important for us, and, and not just at church, but as individuals. When we read a passage of Scripture, the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. If we read something, we say, boy, that, that contradicts itself, and that's a little bit confusing. Spend a little time studying it. Find out what this word really means and what this, uh, the, the circumstances going on, because it, it can be confusing at times, and I don't know it all. I don't have the answers to all of it, but we can study that and kind of figure out uh, what, what John is talking about when we understand how he speaks and the words that he used. So he's saying, okay, the contrast to say we've never sinned is this. If we'll confess our sins, we are sinners, uh, he says the that you lie, you, you've made yourself out to be a liar, the truth is not in you. However, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, or faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, 
like I said, this kind of looks like it stands in sharp contrast to what we read at the first, and that's why I kind of wanted to revisit again. Romans 8, 1 says, uh, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What I want us to do is I want us to think about this, this verse, and especially in verse 9, I want us to look at salvation versus confession, okay? Because we have a couple of things going on here, and I, I want to try to make it clear. I hope I don't hope I don't confuse myself, and I certainly hope I don't confuse you. But, but so, so in verse nine, that word confess, it's a, it, it's in the present tense, and and forgive and cleanse is in this what they call a Greek aorist tense. Okay, so so it's a little bit different meaning, but what that Greek means is it's focusing on an action that's already been completed. Now, kind of stay with me. I know you, this is easy to get bogged down. And you think, oh, man, I, I didn't sign up for all this stuff today. Let's get through. We can get to lunch. But, but, but listen, so, so that, that Greek word is something that is, that is already completed, okay? So confession points to an ongoing action. In other words, as John writes here, if we confess our sins, an ongoing action, we all sin every day. We, 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 we sin, we, we confess to God, and the Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us. He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We get up, we confess our sins, we confess our sins, we confess our sins. So, so that's an ongoing action. The, the other part of that, that John uses is forgiveness and cleansing, okay? Now, what that word means in, in, in the Greek is this. It's something that's an action that's already been completed in the past. Now, here's why I want us to understand, and this is what I'm trying to get straight in my mind. A confession is something that's ongoing. Now, you don't confess to a priest. You don't have to go to the preacher and confess. What did Jesus do on the cross? It says he, he tore that temple curtain apart, and you know what that means? It means we got direct access to God the Father. So we don't go through somebody to get to God the Father. See, the Old Testament, they went through the priests, the Levites, to get to God the Father. When Jesus Christ came and gave us a new covenant, we have direct access to God the Father. We confess our sins directly to God the Father. We have Jesus Christ who is speaking on our behalf. He's our advocate. He's our lawyer who's, who's pleading our case before the God the Father. That's an ongoing action. But the other side of that, that cleansing... That forgiveness, that comes at salvation. And as I said in the Greek, it's something that's already been settled. So the Bible says that uh, John 3.16 3, says, If we believe in our heart, you know, or for God so loved the world, that whoever believeth in him, when we believe in God the Father, we ask him into our heart, we receive all the benefits of salvation. When we, when we come to Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and we are cleansed from all our sins. Isn't that great? I mean, they are, they are forgiven, they are forgotten, and they are cast away. Now, that's not the sins. It's, it, it's always me looking back on my sins of the past. But Jesus Christ died. He defeated all sin. So, so we, we received all the benefits of salvation. So the, when we receive that, John says we go on confessing our sins. Now, Here's what we do sometimes. We confess sins that's already been forgiven. I used an illustration one time of a, of a, of a person coming down the altar carrying a bag of sins, and they go to the altar, and they kind of unload this bag of sins there on the altar, and they pray, and they say, God, I've got this bag of sins. I'm confessing them to you. I'm lifting them to you. I ask forgiveness, and, and I ask you to cleanse me from all unrighteousness, and they get up and put the bag back on their back and walk back out. We tend to do that. We tend to say, God, forgive me and cleanse me from some sin in the past. Once we've confessed it, once God has cleansed us, the Bible says he remembers it no more. That is great news, folks. It says he cast it as far as the east is from the west and remembers it no more. I kind of thought to myself, you know, well, boy, I... Uh, when I was in school, I remember robbing that gas station. I did not rob a gas station, okay? Don't, boy, Jake, boy, he let it go this morning. But, but imagine this. Uh, I go to God. I say, God, I, 
uh, I want to I want to be saved. I'm a sinner. I said, no, and by the way, I robbed this gas station, and God forgives me, and he cast as far as the east is from the west, and, and 10 years later, I said, God, you just got to forgive me for robbing that gas station. He's going to go, what are you talking about? I don't remember you robbing no gas station. Why? Because he's forgot it. We don't have the ability to do that, but God does. So, so when we look at this, remember forgiveness and cleansing are actions that have taken place in the past. Our forgiveness, our cleansing. Folks, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, if you've asked him into your heart, we have forgiveness and we have cleansing, but we continue to confess our sins and he's faithful and just to cleanse us. You know, there's something, there's something about cleansing. Y'all remember over in John chapter 13, the disciples came in and the Bible says uh, that Jesus took a basin of water and he put a towel on his arm and he, belt, he bent down and he began to wash the disciples' feet. And one of the disciples, I'm sorry I didn't look this up, uh, I, I don't even, I'm not even going to throw a name out there. One of y'all can probably answer this. I said, hey, don't just wash my feet, wash my whole body. And y'all remember what Jesus said to him? He said, a person who has bathed only needs their feet washed. Well, during that time, you know, when you came into a house and, and just imagine you had on sandals and you've been out on the beach and you've been walking, not that they were on a beach there in a sandy area and, and that, that old sand, red clay sand gets on between your toes and on your ankles and around the straps of your sandals and so you went into somebody's house, you pulled those things off as a, uh, being courteous, and then the servant of the house came and, and washed your feet, and then you went on into the house and you had the meal or whatever took place there. Well, Jesus is doing that for his disciples. No, nobody washed the feet, and he takes on that role of a servant. He's teaching them to be the role of a servant, but not only that, He's showing them what that represents. So, so there when the, the disciple Peter said, I believe it was Peter says to, says to Jesus, hey, just why not a whole bath? He is teaching them that, hey, once you have accepted Jesus Christ, you have been cleansed, you have been forgiven, you have been bathed, you have been made right again with God, but this cleaning that takes place is an ongoing process. So, so that picture he had there is an ongoing process picture of the confession of sin, but that forgiveness and cleansing is the ideal of, hey, you've already had a bath. Jesus said the guy that has a bath don't need another bath. He just needs those feet cleaned. Now, y'all understand, I'm kind of paraphrasing that. You can go and look at that for yourself in John chapter 13, but, but that's what Jesus says. You don't need another bath just because you got out and got a little dirt on your feet. Well, folks, when we're sinners, when we get a little dirt on our feet, we don't have to be re-saved. We simply go to God and he, he cleans that sin up. He cleans that, that, that he gives us that forgiveness. Doesn't it, doesn't it feel good when you, you've been out working all day and you come in and you, you just get cleaned up? You just, boy, it's freshness. Maybe you go deer hunting for a week and you ain't had a bath in five days. Anybody been there? <laughs> Amen. You know, boy, you go and you're there and you just, you're there. You just smell like the woods rotted somewhere you know and uh and you're there and then you come home and you get a share and you get cleaned up and you think boy that feels good just to be cleansed and clean that's what jesus christ is talking about when we confess our sins he cleanses us not re-saves us he just washes that mud off and we have that we have that cleansing because of the confession so that that that's what as paul goes so here's the last claim this morning the claim says this, if we say we've never sinned, uh, if we say that we have, ne if we say we have not sinned, okay, we say we have not sinned, that, that, that phrase there, we have not sinned, again, that goes back to the, uh, the, the Greek term that would mean I have never sinned at any point in my life. You know, there's people that believe that. There's people that believe they have never sinned. And it's kind of interesting sometimes if you say, you know, what are some sins? Usually, what do we do? We'll think and we'll say, well, murder, stealing. We won't get any sins. We're close to us, will we? We're like, boy, I'm going to throw some big ones out there uh, that I'm not involved in. That's kind of how we are. And people say, you know what, I've just, 
Uh, I just, I can't think of any sin. I've never killed anybody. I'm good to everybody. Uh, people like me. I try to help out. I'm good in the community. The community like me. I, I help little old ladies across the street. You know, I'm, I've done everything. I'm, I'm just a pretty good person. That's kind of where we are today if we say we have not sinned. I'll tell you what we've become real good at, and that's relabeling sin. We've come good at relabeling it. The danger is that is you take a bottle of poison in your cabinet and you put on there mouthwash, it's still poison, ain't it? All you did was change the label, but it's still poison. We've done that with sin. We've taken sin and we've relabeled it to where it sounds a whole lot better than poison. It sounds a whole lot better than sin. You know, we... Uh, and I listed some things. I hope I don't hurt anybody's feelings, but I, I just was thinking about some sins. We have uh, all kinds of, of sins that people have relabeled as d- diseases, and we have, we have sins that, that say, well, we, we don't say we have alcoholics or drug addicts. We say they have a chemical dependency. That sounds a little better, doesn't it? Don't that water it down just a little bit? I was just thinking, uh, uh, what is abortion claim? It's a, it's a woman's right to choose. It's not abortion. That's that's kind of that's kind of rough. It's a woman's what we we have a we we used to call a, a, a somewhat have an affair or adultery. They uh, now they just call it a, a sexual orientation. That's just uh, it, it's it's not that bad. You know, we just let's just re let's just rename it. We we have different ways of of taking terms and making them polite terms and applying them to the poison of sin and putting on the cabinet and saying, you know what, after all, it's not that bad. You know, lying's just stretching the truth. Lying's just over-exaggerating sometimes. Doesn't that sound better than, than uh, well, I lied about that? Doesn't it sound better to say, well, I, I was just over-exaggerating a little bit? That, that just waters it down. And folks, I think that's why we have people today that come to the point of their life of saying, hey, I've... I can't think that I've sinned. Oh, maybe some, maybe some little white lies, maybe some little things, but, but nothing major. I just can't think of that. So, so Paul says if we claim that we have never sinned, the consequences are it doesn't say we're a liar. It says we make God a liar. So if you come to that point of saying, hey, I've sinned, uh, uh, John says we take that position, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. So those that claim that, hey, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've just don't sin, never have sinned, don't need Christ, don't need a Savior, don't need a way to heaven, I'm going to get to heaven because I've been a good person, I've done everything right, so because of that, God is going to look at me. I talked to last week about we kind of think we got this deal worked out with God where we can kind of wink at him. You know, we got our own thing going, me and God, and we're buddies, and he's the big man in the sky, and, and we're just homies. We hang out together. You know, no, it don't work that way. God says sin is sin, and he will not look upon it, and we'll not enter into heaven through unless we have the blood of Jesus. And you know what it does? God looks at us through the blood of Jesus and sees us as righteous and holy and cleansed. He doesn't look at us and say, hey, you've done all these good things. I think I'm going to go ahead and let you into heaven. John says this, we we are make God out to be a liar, and the word of God does not dwell in us. You know, uh, if we make him to be a liar, then we're denying him as a savior. You know what that's called? It's called blasphemy. The Bible says there's one sin that God doesn't forget, and that's blasphemy. And what that is is that's never accepting Jesus Christ. That's giving the credit of what Christ done to someone else. That's blaspheming. When we say to God, God, I don't need Jesus Christ to get to heaven, what are we doing? We're saying, on my own merit, I don't need Christ because I've done the work myself. That's what that ideal of blasphemy is. It's it's the amount of, of calling God a liar. That's what it amounts to. Here's the last thing, the contrast of those two. If we fail to have an advocate, when we fail to have an advocate to the Father, John says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. No question, it's better if we don't sin. But he covers twice in there, we're going to sin. We're going to fall. We're going to fail. So he wrote these things that we may not sin, 
But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, who is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he himself is the payment for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. So through, the, through this verse, John's telling the reader that, that sin is inherited in the human life. I've talked about this before. You go over to Romans. If you want a good book to study on salvation and understanding sin, go read Romans and do a little study. It says we inherited sin from Adam and Eve. Every person born is sinful by nature. We are, we are children of wrath by nature. John's saying there, you know, we've inherited sinful life, and we have an advocate through Jesus Christ when we confess our sins. So, so when we look at this, notice the verse doesn't say we cannot sin. John doesn't write, say, I write these things so you cannot sin. He say, I write these things that you may not sin. Yet in verse 8 and verse 10, he says, we're going to sin at times, and we're going to fail Christ. We're going to fail God at times. What then? We confess our sins. We seek forgiveness. We seek that cleansing that God offers, and we receive it from the Father. So Thomas Griffin, and we're closing here, says, If any man sins, we have an advocate. There is no allowance for sin, but there is a perfect provision in case we do sin. No need to sin, no right to sin, no compromise with sin, no license to sin, but provisions when we do sin. On board of a ship, there's provisions of a lifeboat not associated with any intention to have a shipwreck, but are there in case there's a need. When it says, if any man sins, we have an advocate. That's a provision in case of a need. Folks, we have Jesus Christ that says, I'm the provision in case of need. I'm the provision that we have. Uh, we're going we're gonna to close with that. There's, there's one quick story. Uh, there's a story about Charles Feeney. He's a preacher, an old preacher from the past. You may have heard him. He, he, this is a true story. He was preaching in Chicago. Uh, there was a man came up to him and said, I want you to go home with me, Mr. Feeney, today after the message. It was a nighttime crusade. Those who knew the man that came forward said, do not go. We know this guy. Don't go home with him. Uh, he went ahead and went. He went to the man's house, said he walked in. The man locked the door, pulled a revolver out of his pocket and said, don't be afraid, Mr. Finney. I'm not going to shoot you. But I heard you preach tonight about the Lord Jesus Christ. This revolver has killed four men. Is there any hope for a person like that? Finney replied, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses. For the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And the man answered, you don't understand, Mr. Finney. Down below this apartment where we're sitting, there's a saloon. I've helped send men down the road to hell. I've helped them rob their own children of food and milk. Is there any hope for a man who would run a saloon, and Finney said, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The man continued, but I've been a gambler all my life. I spent my life taking money from people literally. Is there any hope for a man like that? And Finney said, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And the man persisted. He said, across the street, is a wife that I've abused, a little girl who I've disfigured. One night she came. I came home from gambling. I was drinking, and I was in a drunken stupor. The child ran to put her arms around me. I pushed her away. She fell on the heater and disfigured herself. Is there any hope for a man like that? And Finney said, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Soon after Finney left, the next morning, the man stumbled across the street to his house. He had not slept that night. He had spent all night praying, Finney said. He got into the house. He went up to his room. In a little while, his wife said to the little girl, go tell your daddy, get up, it's time for breakfast. She went upstairs and said, Mama says, get up, it's time for breakfast. And the man says, Maggie, darling, I don't want any breakfast this morning. 
She ran back downstairs and said, Mama, Daddy said that he didn't want any breakfast this morning, and he called me darling. The mother said, well, you made a mistake. You must have heard him wrong. Go back up there and tell him it's time for breakfast. And in a moment, down the stairs came the man. He took his wife in his arms, his little girl on his knee. Oh, wife, he wept. I have sinned against you like few men have ever sinned against anyone. But last night, I heard a preacher, and he told me about the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses from all sin. You have a new husband. Daughter, you have a new daddy. And now, that's the truth about my sin. Let's bow our heads. You know, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter about your, about your past. Jesus Christ's blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It doesn't matter where we are. Jesus' blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we say it doesn't matter if I sin, the truth is not in us. If we say we move past the point of sin, we're a liar. The truth is not in us. If we say, I've never sinned, we call God a liar, and the truth is not in us. The bottom line is we have all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's mark. But today he stands, we sang a song a while ago that says, come to the Father. He stands with arms open wide. That's the picture we have today. A, a loving Father, God the Father, not saying I've got a list of rules and rituals and things you need to follow, but, but with an offer of, hey, I have an invitation to become part of my family to inherit eternal life through my Son, Jesus Christ. That's the invitation today. If you've never accepted Christ, I want to ask you, would you let the Holy Spirit lead you this morning? Would you allow the Holy Spirit to direct your thoughts Direct your steps this morning. If we have a time of invitation here in just a moment, would you just uh, say, God, I, wanna, I want you to direct me in the decision I make today. Father, I pray today, as we look at the truth of your word, Father, we realize that the truth about sin is, is we have all sinned. There's a difference. There's lost sinners and there's saved sinners. And today you offer an invitation that we might accept you, claim the blood of Calvary to cleanse us, to clothe us in your righteousness. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would move freely among your people as we have this time of invitation. And I pray this in the name of Jesus.